The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed in this episode are that of the guest and host and do not necessarily reflect the values of sponsors or other associated organizations. Welcome to the Parental Compass by Family Education and Support Services. I'm your host, Bobby Williams. Subscribe to the show, leave us a review, tell a friend about the show. If you enjoy the show, why not tell a friend? There's a standard thought when it comes to parenting that it's important to get compliance from your children, and this can be done through rewards and consequences. Our guest has a different approach. Alfie Cohn is the author of multiple books, including Unconditional Parenting, Punished by Rewards, and No Contest. You can find these titles and more at his website, alfiecohn.com. Alfie explains how instead of focusing on short-term compliance, we need to raise our children to be free thinkers that find their motivations from within. He explains all this and much more. Let's check it out. Well, let's back up a step and understand that punishment never gets us anything beyond temporary compliance. If I say to a kid, do this or here's what I'm going to do to you, um, that kid comes to ask the question, uh, what do I have to do to please this person in power and what happens to me if I don't? And that ends up screwing up the relationship and leading kids to just focus on self-interest and to be less likely to think about the interests of other people. Well, everything there is also true of reward. If we say to kids, instead of saying, do this or here's what I'm going to do to you, we say to them, do this and you'll get that. Then the question the child comes to ask is, What do I have to do to please this person with the power? And how do I benefit from that? It's all about power and self-interest. Rewards and punishments are not opposites. They're they're two sides of the same coin. They're both ways of um, controlling children, of getting compliance, but at an enormous cost of causing kids to be less concerned about the impact of their actions on other people. The real alternative here is not whether we bribe them versus threaten them, but rather we do whether we do either version of what I call a doing to approach, or rather the real alternative is to work with them to solve problems. But isn't life kind of competition in a lot of ways or i guess there's rewards in life like you do good at your job and you get promoted like isn't that just a little prep work for what's going to come later in life oh well it's prep work for the worst kind of arrangement in workplaces or other environments that leads kids to accept that dysfunctional arrangement as inevitable rather than helping them to see that there are alternatives for adults as well. The best workplaces don't bribe people either. There's a big difference between compensation, paying people, which everybody needs to have money in an industrialized economy, and on the other hand, some form of pay for performance or merit pay or bonuses commissions. Those are bad in the workplace, just as trying to manipulate children or students is bad as well. And by the way, even if um, something is widespread, though not desirable later in life, you don't prepare children to deal with unpleasant situations by immersing them in unpleasantness or control earlier. That sort of better get used to it mentality is a profoundly conservative strategy that's mostly about perpetuating the status quo that doesn't benefit most people uh, by pretending it's inevitable and that we have to start doing bad things to kids when they're small. 
Mm. Well, then how do you get kids to want to do the right thing then, if not motivated by punishment or reward? How do you get them thinking for themselves? Well, let's let's take apart those terms there. The right thing and thinking for themselves are different from each other slightly, though we hope they often overlap. But both of them are very different from what most traditional parenting strategies involving rewards and punishments are about, which is not about the right thing. And it's certainly not about thinking for themselves. It's about doing whatever the adult tells them. So let's be clear that we often try to justify controlling behavior by invoking ideas of independent thought or good ethics and so on. But most parenting resources are really about eliciting mindless obedience for the convenience of the grown-up. And that's the exact opposite of the kind of independent thought that most people on reflection say they want for their kids. Now, intrinsic motivation, which means doing things because you find them valuable or worthwhile in their own right is completely different from extrinsic motivation in which kids are motivated to do something so they'll get something out of it. And that's a very important point when we talk about how do we motivate kids. I think that's exactly the wrong question. I don't care how motivated my kids are. I care how my kids are motivated. And an enormous body of psychological research has found that the more you reward people for doing something, the more they tend to lose interest in whatever they, um, whatever they had to do to get the reward. So, in other words, when we use extrinsic motivators, induce, artificial inducements like, like goodies and so on, stickers, and, and stars and dessert and uh, special treats and privileges, or even what amount to verbal doggy biscuits, like saying, good job, whenever they jump through our hoops and please us, they become less intrinsically motivated to do that thing. That, so, that's interesting, um, because what, what I hear you saying is the reward or the consequence just shifts things towards selfishness. But as a parent, you want to offer praise. So is there an alternative to that then? Why do you want to offer praise if it has those effects? Hmm. I, mean, I mean, I think it's really interesting that you point that out, and you're right. The reason most parents praise or reward has nothing to do with the well-being or the character of the, or the, or, or the interest of the child. It's because we want to. And man, whenever that's true, whenever we're doing something for our, because we feel the compulsion to do it, or because it was done to us, or because we falsely believe that it will have a certain effect, or we feel weird if we don't do it, it is really time to rethink our practice, especially when the research shows quite clearly that it's not just ineffective, but rewards and punishments of all kinds are counterproductive. They actually do harm. They undermine the things that most parents, when they're asked to really think about it, um, would like to do. And it's not just about the selfishness. It's about undermining whatever they want to do. If you reward children for um, uh, doing some other task, for drawing pictures, to, you know, to your satisfaction, they become less interested in art. Whatever it is that you think is important, rewarding them for doing it or punishing them for not doing it makes them less autonomous and also less committed to that action. What do you say as an alternative then? Your child wins the soccer game. Do you just say, you won the soccer game? Or I... I I'm just trying to think of like the real life applications of this line. Uh -huh. Well, first of all, we could take a step backward and, and ask about alternatives to competitive sports where kids can play and have a good time and get exercise without necessarily playing the kinds of games we're used to in this country that involve one group of people triumphing over another. 
But let's say we're not willing to go quite that far. Um, when a child um, is successful, we can describe what we saw. Um, I noticed you doing a certain kind of, of of kick here. I don't know anything about soccer, you know. But um, uh-huh. <laughs> I can we can ask questions, you know, about you know how did you feel when that happened, or how did you figure out how to do that maneuver on the field. We can be there to support them, to offer encouragement and so on. But what we don't need to do is steal their pleasure by telling them how to feel, by saying, in effect, how I feel, whether I'm impressed, is what the point is. Because then kids become more dependent. Did you see me out there? Was that good? Did you think I was good then? The message that kids need to hear from us is unconditional love and support, which means they know um, that we love them, that we care for them, that we attend to them um, for who they are, not for what they do. And it's so important that they don't experience our care as having strings attached, where we get a lot more excited about them, pay more attention to them, when they score the winning goal, when they get an A in school, when they're well-behaved or pretty or smart or funny or whatever. And unfortunately, so many traditional parenting resources, blog posts, books, articles, lectures, seminars, podcasts, webinars, all of those traditionally offer some variation of what sadly amounts to conditional parenting. I mean, take, for example, the very cruel practice of forcibly isolating little children when they need us most, which we euphemistically call time out, because that makes us feel better, that name about making kids feel bad, or positive reinforcement. Those are ways of saying to kids, you have to earn my love and attention, or even being in the same room with me. The real alternative, you know, is we solve problems together when there are problems. We celebrate with them and show them we care about them um, and are happy for their successes. But those things are not integral. We love them even when they screw up or fall short. That unconditional approach coupled with giving them more say about their lives helps them to grow up feeling committed to to good things and feeling uh, valuable, um, not merely a result of, of pleasing or impressing. It, it seems like what you're saying is you're teaching them how to have that validation from within. Yes, which doesn't mean being isolated and nor being completely self-sufficient, but it certainly means something very different than being d- dependent where they have to look to us or somebody else constantly for mm-hmm. a sense of validation. You talked a little bit about soccer and you're not a fan of um, competitive games. Can you explain that a little bit more? Because I think like almost every game seems competitive to me. Well, that's only because no one has introduced you to the vast number of games that are non-competitive. In fact, I just wrote a blog piece on this recently, uh, which is on my on my website if you're interested um, that also contains links to some great resources for fun cooperative games, both board games for indoors and cooperative games outdoors. Um, my very first book many years ago was, was about this topic called No Contest, in which I looked at research demonstrating that competition holds people back from doing their best work um, or play or learning and um, also has typically a destructive impact on self-esteem, psychological health, and on our feelings about other people. So I don't primarily focus on playtime. I'm much more concerned about really destructive things like awards assemblies, grading on a curve, spelling bees, um, and other Uh, competitive arrangements in schools, and for that matter, workplaces, that teach kids, I can be successful only when other people fail. 
that's not a necessary part of life. That's a feature of a, a particular set of rules or structures or cultures uh, that unnecessarily pit us against one another. So that turns out to be true in the weekends as well. So let's take a, I'll take one quick example here. Um, the first game I ever learned, because I'm an American, uh, was at a birthday party, and it featured n number of children scrambling frantically for n minus one chairs. Mm -hmm. and the music. I've started. heard of that one. Yeah. Yeah. Have. Yeah. Right. So the music stops. Everybody runs from a chair, and by design, some kid can't get one. Out. Take away a chair. Start the music again, out again, out again, out, 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 till at the end, every, you got one kid sitting there, smug, triumphant, the winner, everybody else excluded from play, unhappy losers. That's how you learn to have a good time in America. <laughs> well, along comes uh, one particular uh, researcher and thinker on this topic who said, why don't we take away a chair each round, but change the game so that all the kid, kids have to fit on a diminishing number of seats until at the end you've got all the kids giggling, trying to figure out how to squish on a single chair. Everybody succeeds together on an increasingly difficult set of tasks. Everybody plays to the end. Everybody has a good time. That's what I did with my kids' birthday parties, incidentally. And that's what a lot of people do once they realize that having a good time doesn't have to mean me against everybody else or, or even more uh, toxically, us against them. War minus the shooting, as one person put it. Um, so and I like to say that until you've played cooperative games, you really don't understand how much fun competition isn't. I do a lot of, I lead a nonprofit organization. We do a lot of team building activities and it is fun yep. working together. Uh, I think your detractors would say that it's important for you to learn failure and have practice with failure. Uh, what's your response to that? I have two responses. One is that the psychological research shows that failure is overrated in terms of its benefits. We'll all end up failing, like it or not, on plenty of things. We don't have to pro deliberately provide for unnecessary additional failure. Um, but what predicts to success tomorrow is more likely to be some success today. So studies, for example, have found that when kids are made to fail on, a, on some sort of task without knowing it's, it, that that they, that they can't succeed. They end up thinking of themselves as less competent than they really are and being less likely to succeed later than they're capable of doing. So failure to some extent is always going to happen, but it doesn't really provide the benefits that a lot of sort of social conservatives believe. This notion that if you, if you trip and fall on your face, then you're going to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and say, by golly, I'm going to try even harder next time. That is even more utopian and unrealistic than the most progressive person I've ever found. That's my first response. Failure, according to research rather than mere ideology, is, is not usually particularly beneficial. But my second response is, even if you believe some failure is good, that doesn't justify the uniquely poisonous version of failure called losing, where you have to fail so that somebody else can succeed. There's plenty of ways we can all have lots of experience with success and failure without ever setting kids against each other so that they have to try to step on each other's faces, in effect let alone do that and call it a game and never teach them more constructive and enjoyable ways to have fun. This is a fascinating conversation. I feel like we should be doing an hour, but the format of the show is relatively short. Do you have any closing words or ideas you want to leave the audience with? Oh, I, I think this is already enough that's, that's, that's provocative. If anything I've said seems... Um, like a little too radical or surprising or disorienting, um, 
that's the sign of how thoroughly we've been socialized to take on faith things like rewards and punishments and competition as either inevitable or or desirable. And I'm always inviting people to ask the radical questions. And by radical, I mean root questions. That's what the word radical means. You don't just ask, what kind of punishments should I, or should I do spanking versus time out? Or should I do rewards versus punishment? Or which rewards or on what schedule? Or what kind of competitive games? But to take a step back and ask, why are we doing this at all? Does it really promote good values in the long run? Does it really help kids to become the kind of people we want them to? And does research support the effects we thought it had? Because maybe the response is going to be not to tweak the traditional approaches, but to question them and move, as I try to offer uh, people guidelines for doing in my books and articles, what can we do that may be qualitatively different to help kids turn out to be really good people, even if it means being a little bit less uh, focused on short-term compliance? Thank you so much for being here today, Alfie. My pleasure. Thank you, Alfie. AlfieCone.com. We appreciate you taking the time. This has been the Parental Compass by Family Education and Support Services. I'm Bobby Williams. We'll see you next week. Peace.